Everybody, you're listening to Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandace.com and sign up for our Patreon account. You get early access to episodes, live AMAs, bonus content, and it helps us to continue podcasting. This week, I'm really excited. We have Marek Zlimzowski joining the conversation. He is a best-selling author of the book, Chasing Black Unicorns. It's a cautionary tale of a business partnership gone wrong, how he became an international fugitive, and it's filled with a lot of practical business advice. Marek is also an impact entrepreneur, and he's doing his best to solve some of the world's greatest problems. We had a really good conversation about accountability, introspection, and his wild ride. I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you want to support Merrick or learn more about him, you can go to chasingblackunicorns.com and I'll provide the link in the show notes. Enjoy the episode. Thank you for joining the podcast. So you are the author of Chasing Black Unicorns. Um, you are from Poland, ended up in Nigeria. You're now in the Dominican Republic. So do you gotta, kind of want to um, explain to the listeners how your book came about, like the inspiration behind it, what um, got you from Poland to Nigeria and just like a little bit of your background? Yeah, yeah. I will try to give you like a 60 second bio (laughs) of myself. Uh, So Polish born and raised, uh, made my first so-called money in uh, the post-communist Poland where basically the economy was booming, then lost all my money during the 2008 crisis, Uh, ended up as a bartender, and at some point, I had this crazy idea, uh, screw it, I'm moving to Africa because if Alibaba is so big in China and Amazon is so huge in the States, Africa needs its own Amazon. So there was this team of crazy guys and an investment fund. We moved to Nigeria in 2012. And uh, we ended up building a business called Jumia, which landed on New York Stock Exchange last year. So that was like an amazing adventure with so many crazy stories because we essentially built a from scratch e-commerce business there. And in countries like Nigeria or Kenya, uh, the internet penetration was super low. There were no logistics companies. There were no warehouses. So we had to actually build our own infrastructure and a lot of great, crazy learnings uh, that came out of it. That was an extremely business-wise positive adventure. But also in the process, I got myself myself into some deep shit. (laughs) Basically, (laughs) another business I launched, I opened it with with people I should never open the business with. Unfortunately, it's a pretty popular scheme in exotic countries like Nigeria where the local partner at some point decides to get rid of the foreign investor. And there are many ways to do that. Mm. And one way is to bribe Nigerian police, put you into jail. And only after you give them back the company, give them the shares, you will be released. And that's basically what happened to me. I decided to go the hard way, meaning fight this case in courts. Took two years. I'm right now the first foreigner in the history of Nigeria that took Nigerian police to courts and win. (laughs) Nigerian police owes me money. And, uh, and that was the crazy negative adventure and all the stress that w- went with it. And I figured uh, this is actually a, a, an interesting story to combine because I can write a book that doesn't only have some interesting business insights for people interested in business in Africa, but there's also some criminal plot and some, you know, some action, action movie type of plot because of what happened to me in the other parts of my life. So I put this into a book, Chasing Black Unicorns. Um, And in order to make a statement that I'm not doing this for money, we've also launched a charity together with my fiance and all the profits from the sales of the book, as well as my speaking engagements go into this charity Mm -hmm. because living right now, almost 10 years in Africa, I've realized that the NGOs and the charity organizations are one of, one of the worst things that happened to Africa in terms of how much bad PR they're bringing in, how, how they are mismanaged and so on. And I figured, if I'm going to open my own charity, it's going to be super tiny, but at least I know what happens to the money. Um, mm. and, and that was the, the thing that came out of all those experiences that happened to me. So that wasn't a 60 second. That was like 300 seconds. So <laughs> That was still really fast to cover like all of that stuff. So it's pretty common for like that's like the um, – I guess the main strategy to get a foreign investor out in I guess Nigeria is to just get you arrested by the police and like kind of blackmail you. Yeah, so um, a, a context here. Um, there's this amazing organization called the Interpol in the world, which uh, has members from 190 countries, mm. which has a very noble goal, 
if you're a criminal in one country, you don't just want to, we don't want that criminal to move to another country and start fresh, right? Mm -hmm. um, but just like with Facebook or Google or social media, the, 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 the purpose of building these businesses was amazing to connect people, but we ended up at having, you know, mobile applications that make you addicted. Same thing with Interpol. Just like YouTube or Facebook has this problem that anyone can post anything, and if they don't have the right to do it, but they don't want to take it down, you know, good luck going to Facebook or YouTube. So YouTube take, takes it down. It's going to mm. take you hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers, and it's going to take you years to do that. Mm. It's the same problem with Interpol, because any country, any police station in any country that is a member of Interpol that has access to the internet and to the Interpol system, they can put and scan their local arrest warrant into the global system. And immediately you are wanted everywhere. So as long as you can bribe some local police officer in Nigeria that will sign something and then the local judge, overnight you become an international fugitive anywhere you go. And that's what happened to me. Wow. And, and unfortunately, this is a, a very popular scheme because I had to go the rabbit hole by really exploring what are the problems with Interpol. And you can write books just about Interpol problems. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the CEO of Interpol was arrested by China and now is in jail. <laughs> uh, before 2000, I think, eight or 10 uh, World Cup, FIFA has donated $20 million to Interpol so they don't chase their members after the corruption problem came out. When Donald Trump bombarded Iran, Iran government has issued an arrest warrant after Donald Trump using, using Interpol. Anyone can do this for after anyone. And obviously oh, wow. it, didn't, it didn't work for Donald Trump, but cases like me is more than 20,000 every year in Interpol. And the whole problem is that it's going to take you years for Interpol to analyze your case. And during those two years, you can't move, your bank's account are frozen, you can't do anything because in the global systems of the banks, you're considered as a criminal. Mm -hmm. It's designed at destroying your financial situation, your image, and so on. And that's when I got this offer I couldn't refuse. We can solve your problems. We know how to do it. Just have to sign these papers to, to, to sell the company. So that's the, that's the Interpol context. And uh, I guess my Polish blood uh, started boiling. And <laughs> I, I wasn't really aware of what I'm about to fight with. But I just said, no, no, fucking not, not at all. Like, I'm not going to give you the company that I've been building for the last couple of years. And I'm going to fight this. In the end, it cost me way more money than the company was worth because I had to have lawyers from different countries that are specialized in these problems. But uh, I guess it was more than, than just money. It was about proving something. And then, to be honest, because I had to spend the night in jail, and I went through all the stages of grief during that night in jail. I think one of the most important nights, days, um, times of my, moments in my life. At one point, I just told myself, if I get out of this life, I can write a book about it. And the, <laughs> The, the concept of being able to share my story uh, was a pretty damn strong motivation uh, mm -hmm. because through those two years, there were a couple of moments when I thought I lost, when the extradition request was almost granted and I thought I'm going to Nigeria and mm -hmm. I wouldn't get out of there. Uh, and I was depressed. I had to start doing psychotherapy. I even did ayahuasca to try to find some spiritual meaning in everything mm -hmm. that I was doing. And uh, the concept of writing the book was also like finishing this chapter of my life, which was very important from the psychotherapy uh, mm -hmm. aspect as well, because I was ready to let go everything that happened to me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, thank God that, you know, it, it ended with a happy end, which is not always the case in, in situations like this. That's so fascinating. So real quick, I, I'd like to start at the roots for a second. And so you grew up in Poland. I think your father was yeah. a soldier. Your mother was a school teacher. Yeah. Okay. And then you went from there to an entrepreneur to an international um, <laughs> fugitive. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> I would like, let's go back to the beginning. Like what, what had started it? Where, like, when did you know you wanted to start your own companies? When did you know you wanted to work for yourself? Like at what point in your childhood did you, did something click? And I think I remember yeah. you. I think I remember you saying um, you don't want to be limited by the place of your birth in one of the other podcasts that you were on. So yeah, what led to that thought process? What led to that mindset? Everything makes sense when you look at it from hindsight, right? But mm -hmm. back then, 
you were just driven by different type of motivations. I was born in this super, super tiny city. My mom was a teacher. My father was a soldier. They were getting paid by the government. It was post-communist Poland. Um, but I had family in Germany and I could see how they are living versus how I am living. They were sending me chocolates from Germany because we couldn't, you know, just, you know, buy chocolates because we were living very humble in a way. And then my mom being my mom being very strict, I was like 14 or 15. She told me, I'm going to help you choose your job. You're good at mathematics. So you will, you will go to study to university to become a teacher. I will help, help you find a job as a teacher in my school. My father will help you build a house. And, uh, and there's this cool girl on the street that can be your wife. And obviously I just wanted to get out. And we had uh, back then satellite television. So I could watch again, those beautiful uh, movie clips of just, you know, kids having, enjoying their life in California, right? And mm -hmm. here I am in Koszalin in cold Poland in December when it's just, you know, raining or snowing all the time. All I wanted to do is to get out. And then it's also very important in business later. I was pretty bullied in high school, not high school and not anymore, but in primary school uh, because I was just fat <laughs> because of all those chocolates that I got from Germany. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, lack of self-esteem really made me extremely motivated later in business to prove everyone around that um, you know i'm worth something i can make money and obviously back then you were evaluating yourself by external factors like better salary better car and so on um, and so on but i went into entrepreneurship just because my friend was an entrepreneur and he had a lot of money i didn't, had no clue what it is because no one was an entrepreneur in my family i I remember because how, how controlled I was by my mother, which I really love, but she was very controlling. <laughs> I hated to be told what to do. And I just couldn't imagine working for someone. Um, I even remember a situation when you buy something online and the e-commerce shop tells you to open an account and then you have to create a password. And it tells you that the password has to have one capital letter, one small, one special, a sign, one number. And I'm like, screw you. I'm going to have my own password. And I would even leave those websites because they will not tell me <laughs> what password to have. And, and that was super important for me. Uh, and I thought that that freedom can be given to you when you're an entrepreneur, which is bullshit. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That's cool. So, the, so would you say it sounds like you had a ton of optimism that was like a core belief that, you know, this fundamental idea that things are bound to be better or that something like good is around the corner. Is that true? Or, or was that more of like a muscle that you had to build in order to become an entrepreneur? Um, I think you, hmm, I think most of the thing in, to become a person, a, a good entrepreneur, you definitely must be, you must be born with some sort of a DNA and personality traits. Mm -hmm. um, what you don't have, you probably can work on it. I never have a, had a problem with motivation when it's getting hard and everyone, everyone asks me about it. I never have an issue with that. I have a problem to motivate myself when everything is going well. When you look at my life and my business career and my businesses, it's always a sinusoid because when it's getting too comfortable, business is going well, I become distressed, relaxed. And when I become relaxed, I don't want to work anymore. And obviously, then I stop controlling my company and everything is going bust. And when problem happens, that's when I wake up. So I may consider this as a blessing that the harder it gets, the more motivated I am. But the trade-off is that when it gets very well, I tend to sleep over some problems and even bring myself into new problems simply because of how I demotivated become and uh, stop and lose my guard in mm -hmm. business when it's getting too well, when my, maybe because my internal satisfaction level is too low. That's where all, always my problem was. But I wouldn't say motivate, optim, optimism was, was the main factor, although I probably am an, 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 an impro, an inappropriate optimist. Yeah. So I wanted to ask that kind of segued into, like, what do you think are, I guess, some critical personalities of um, – personality traits of like being an entrepreneur because I feel like we live in this at least in the states we live in like a really big hustle culture where it's like you have to be an entrepreneur and anything else means that you're a failure but 
to me, that's kind of bullshit because a lot of people can't be an entrepreneur and they'd be miserable as, as an entrepreneur. As you said, like you thought it meant freedom, but really you work way more than the average person um, if you want to be successful. So I guess in your eyes, like what does it take to be successful to start your own company? Oh, uh, I always try to run away from questions like this because <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably what works for one person doesn't work for the other one and uh, so many True. other things have to be taken into account. But if you want to somehow pull what is most important as an entrepreneur, I guess you feel like you want to change shit all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you have this need to do something in a slightly in a slightly different way because you know when we're talking about entrepreneur the most important part of being an entrepreneur is that early stage of a company when everything has to be done just by you if you don't do this stuff if you don't push it nothing will happen and if you build your company to a certain level you don't, you're not an entrepreneur anymore you become a manager and uh, you become a ceo really and you stay with the business um the real entrepreneurs are those serial entrepreneurs that just you know at some point get they get bored and they just sell the company they hire someone to do the stuff for them and they change the role within the organization like you could see i think the google guys right they they're the real entrepreneurs like they all cared about this building some cool product so they just hire the ceo and manage this business for me i want to i want to have fun only a few entrepreneurs became the real ceos i guess jeff bezos is like one of those examples that he grew with the company Um, so as cheesy as it sounds, I guess entrepreneur is someone that I'm going to give you an example. I um, used to be a skater when I was a kid. Now I'm a skater deep in heart. Uh, And what's cool about being a skater is every time you're in an office building or you're in a museum or you're in the city, every time you look at stairs, you feel like, oh, I could kickflip out of the stairs. You, you see a ledge or a rail or like, I could actually do a 50-50 here, go down. So everything, you look at stuff differently and you look and see an opportunity. As a skater, you see, you see an opportunity to do a trick. And in business, I landed in Nigeria and I could see an opportunity to open a business at every corner because I could see, okay, this is missing here. I could actually make some money by solving this particular problem. And I think that's the... That's everything starts with that particular mindset and you want to do this on your own and you kind of thrive on chaos. You, you like when stuff are not organized and you want to somehow put this into some, some mechanism, some structure that becomes this business that can run even if you leave it. Right. Instead of like in seeing problems, instead of running away, you see problems as opportunities. I guess. I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, right. You probably every coaching book has that. Um, but if everything was just so, ob- so it's not only about seeing the knowledge is also applying because if it was only about having the knowledge, I guess everyone would be a millionaire with a six pack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the knowledge is there, right? It's just how you apply it. So I guess there's no secret there. I mean, you just need to see opportunities and everything else is just how you do it. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So I wanted, I think you have like the mo- one of the most extreme stories of like a business partnership gone wrong. <laughs> um, I think business partners, it's really hard to navigate for anybody just because like you have two individuals with like fundamental different um, beliefs or uh, goals and visions of the company. And I think you have a really good experience with like, you know, business partners that are filled with friction. So I guess what, how do you, if you were to have another business partner in your next company, like what's your vetting process? Like how do you make sure that it's going to be um, a positive relationship for the long term? Yeah, that's a great example. So um, my business partner, the one when it all went wrong with, he was very similar to me mm-hmm. because it all started with a classic business conflict between the, in, between the you know, main guys in the company, between the management board. And that's the problem when you look for founders or for you know, your wife, your husband, your partner in the relationship. Um, you want to find someone that is um, similar to you in business because then you just eat off each other's ideas. You motivate each other. You instantly understand each other. There are almost no conflicts because you guys think in the same way. But this is very risky for the business because many times no one has the radar. You guys see the same things and you don't see the same things. So many times business can fail. And also once there's a problem, it just gets immediately ignited because this guy has a big ego and this guy has a big ego. And in the end, I was this cocky CEO. I was a little bit too young, a little bit 
a little bit unexperienced, a little bit too cocky by thinking I can do everything because I'm this white investor in Nigeria. And uh, what started as a conflict into, in a business with my friend turned out into huge ego conflict when it wasn't about the money anymore. It was about who's going to prove whom who's right and who's going to show to anyone around that is observing the conflict who's the real alpha male. Mm. And the, the reason why it turned south, it went south, or we, that's how we call, say it, right? It went, mm-hmm. The reason why it went south is because he got so agitated with his emotions, and I, know how to, I knew how to press his buttons, is that at some point he said, screw it, I'm going to break the law to go after this guy. Mm. It could have been me. I just had different, lo- it had different breaks. It's just, it just happened that my business partner was in Nigeria maybe for too long. He has done stuff like this earlier mm-hmm. with someone else. I only learned about this later. But he didn't have a problem to do that. But the same mechanism was driving him and me. It was about the ego, not, the, not about the money at some point. Mm-hmm. And also me going after him, not paying that money, not giving him the company, but going to courts and proving that I am, I am not the criminal here was driven by ego um, mm-hmm. as well. And the reason behind it is that we were the same. And, and my business that I'm having right now uh, is that I have chose business partners, which absolutely are my antithesis, like where I'm strong at, they're weak at. Mm-hmm. It's extremely painful in the very beginning to find a way to work with each other you don't catch each other's ideas and you don't, you're not able to finish each other's sentences. It's that problem of diversity in a team, right? If you're mm-hmm. a white male, after 40, you want to hire the same guys. That's the same problem with like hiring more females, more black people, Asian people inside organizations. But it's the same problem with diversity of personalities in a team. Mm-hmm. And it's very painful at the beginning, but once you guys are mature enough, you've been through some stuff, you're able to not be so emotional about every single thing. Once you sort out those basic issues, that's where you can just reach to the stars because you have a team when our weaknesses and our strengths complement each other. And I, I'm really convinced that where I am right now is, is certain type, such, such a type of a, uh, of a team because each one of us has been through some stuff. We've all been, been through different problems. We all probably came out of it stronger, wiser, uh, peace, more peaceful and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you said not being so emotional during these things. I think I mean, that's certainly a muscle, right? Definitely. Uh, a muscle. You have to go through some. Uh, it's a muscle and it's the possibility of seeing things in perspective. I mean, my father has died a couple of years ago, just around that time when my problems have started. And, and when you just, when you are faced with some real, real big problems in life, you certain, certain, suddenly build this, uh, how do you call it? This, uh, this scale where you see extre- you've been through extremely good situation. You've been through extremely situ situation in life, like losing your closest in life or thinking you're going to go to Nigeria to jail for a couple of years. And then everything else that happens to you suddenly feels so mundane, so normal because you can put it into that scale. And I think the problem with most people is that their scale is super narrow they haven't gone through the extreme positive, extreme negative. This is why they get so emotional about any single thing because for their scale, it's actually pretty big. Oh, that's interesting. That is pretty interesting. Yeah, it sounds, so you did, it sounds like a lot of your journey, it was like the first half was very um, uh, external. Like you were driven by trying to prove yourself or driven by this sense of freedom that you didn't even know what it was, but it, it, you knew something was there, right? Yeah. And then you had... I don't know, I guess we can call it, you hit rock bottom, you're sitting in a prison cell. We've just went through this massive battle. Was that, would you say like that is, was a turning point where you started looking more introspective? Um, it, it started the process. So for, this is why the first chapter of my book is really about me being this bullied kid because what, what created my personality during those moments in my life really drove me for the next 10 years. It's extremely powerful powerful tool to have to have that motivation of that bullied hungry fat kid and it can make you extremely successful in business like when you're running when you're working in sales and so on but if you don't learn how to control that power that you have inside 
it can destroy you from the inside because this internal need of external validation, it's never enough. Like mm -hmm. you, you can never satisfy it. And I've, I've seen people who just went, just never, never able, were never able to control it. And they ended up being addicted to drugs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lavish lifestyle. And at some point they just, they just lost it. Right? And, 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 and we lost them. Uh, but at some point I've realized that if I'm not able to control myself, and that's when the process started. If I'm not able to control my emotions, if in that, during that fight with Interpol and Nigeria, if I'm able to, if I'm not able to stop, defend myself by ego and start defending myself to build new life and become stronger out of it, I would be still chasing this guy and trying to put him to jail right now. And I would destroy myself just by going after him. Uh, and that's where I realized I have to start having different motivation in life because this is the only way I can find peace and survive. And this is why I started psychotherapy, also including psychedelics. Uh, so I did both. I did the scientific way with mm -hmm. psych, you know, medical doc, med medicine doctor, psychologist. And I also went the spiritual way. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, uh, really helped me. And uh, which is, this is why one of my TED talks that relates to this problem ends with a statement, I'm actually now thankful to those guys to my ex-business partner because he changed me. Uh, mm -hmm. If I didn't go through what I went through, I would probably be still this, you know, cocky guy, you know, buying another expensive car and, uh, and going to clubs and then, you know, spending the money you've made. But what is, the, what is there besides? You know? I think it's so important to be able to look at like the lowest moments in our life or the people that have maybe caused us like the most pain and then find like some kind of gratitude in it. Um, because I feel like there's always like a lesson to be learned and it, you can't argue like when you have these extreme moments that they help shape you as a person. Um, would you say that like the ayahuasca and the psychotherapy kind of helps you reframe that or did you kind of just do that on your own? It, it definitely helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of things I, I want to unpack this. Um, I, I even wanted to tattoo this at some point. The tattoo was supposed to go – Never a failure, always a lesson, which is like mm. a stoic, stoic approach to life. Mm. It already happened to you. I mean, you, you might be frustrated or just turn it into a lesson and, and be able to move on from there, um, which was super powerful for me. Ayahuasca has helped me in so many ways, but the most practical way that it helped me was this. And I'm going to give you an example of me sticking to a diet or not drinking alcohol because I, I had also alcohol issues because I had depression and with depression I went into alcohol through through that you know that two years of, of really tough times for me mm. and every time I wanted to have a drink to forget about my problems for a while I would think and I would try to remember the amazing feeling of waking up the next day being fresh 7 a.m. being able to go to the gym, not being hangover, waking up in a place, you know, next to someone I don't remember the name. Mm -hmm. So if you remember that amazing feeling of waking up fresh and being able to go to the gym and be healthy, it helps you deal with that urge to go for a party and have some drink in the evening. What ayahuasca has given me is that you enter the state of absolute love, of not having your ego control you in any way, feeling that oneness with, with the rest of the world, seeing connection with everyone else, even with your enemies. And that is that feeling that I remember deep inside. Mm -hmm. And every time I get annoyed, I get emotional, uh, I want to do something which is driven by my ego, I get pissed off about shit. Right? You know how it is. Mm -hmm. um, I try to meditate and I try to go back down the memory line to how I felt during the ayahuasca um, uh, ceremony of just just being absolutely peaceful and full of love and happiness and so on. It gave me that, it anchored that state, that emotional state, which I always go to when I feel like, you know, too much adrenaline is going, is being pumped into my blood and I'm about to go some stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. So it helped you develop that, that self-awareness to know yeah. when, yeah, when the emotions are starting to take over and when like the, I guess the higher you steps in and starts. Exactly. Like that. Being the breaks. master instead of those breaks, yeah. and it helps you understand it not on a like this rational level. You understand it not only with your brain, but you understand it like with your emotions. I, I go back to the emotion, not just by oh, uh, this is what's happening to me. You know, it's like the difference between reading the music notes and actually you know playing the music. Yeah, that, we talk about that a lot. There's a difference between like knowing something 
um, like logically or academically, but then actually being able to feel it and understand it from like a visceral level is just a totally different, like you can understand how to control yourself. You understand meditation and what meditation means, how to separate like your, get that gap in between like the thoughts and actions and emotions. You understand that, but until you actually do the practice and do the work. Absolutely. And you, I couldn't see it in a more clear way when I started going also to, uh, you know, those anonymous alcoholism, alcoholic groups, because I, I tried to do everything and I tried to find out what works for me to work on my personality. And I would go to a couple of those meetings and, oh my God, how shocked I was. Everyone sitting, that, that wasn't sitting next to me because it was Skype. Um, everyone that was in, during those groups were extremely successful businessmen, lawyers, university professors, book authors. I mean, guys who have IQ above 140. Mm. They all understood perfectly what are the issues behind personality problems, drug addictions, and so on and so on. And absolute knowledge does not help you in anything. And which brings us to that case of business, right? Everyone knows what's, what, they, what makes you successful. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's out there, yeah? But do it. Yeah, right. It's all over Instagram. You know that grit is a thing and that you're supposed to have it, but <laughs> but it's a muscle, right? You need to work at grit. You need to work at having an entrepreneurial mindset or a growth mindset or any of these things. It's not just like just reading or like having some Instagram post yell at you that you need to be more, have more grit. Like that's not going to work. Like, you, need, <laughs> you need to feel it. You need to do it and build that muscle over time. It's it's that those those instagram motivations they're they're cool they're they're super helpful but they're extremely shallow like you can't mm -hmm. just you can't motivate yourself more by watching 10 of them in a row right <laughs> they, they don't add up like they can help you here and there but this is not how you feel the big problem that is inside you in, in the first place yeah did you find that like during your ayahuasca experience did it allow you to kind of see where your neutral was like was there like an overarching emotion that kind of drove you prior to let's just use your your imprisonment for that day as like the the the, the point right prior to that point was there like a an emotion that drove you that you can you were able to identify or maybe a series of emotions that you found that you were like that was your neutral yes that's one of the another thing that happens to you during those ceremonies is that you're able to remember remind yourself about those things from the childhood that are still deep down in your emotions they've been used to program your personality but you don't remember them anymore and they came out yes in few of them and that was the material that then you can use during your uh, psychotherapy sessions so that, that that was extremely powerful a lot of situations that i didn't remember from when i was five year old six years old mainly that I, when i was bullied i really tried to fit in into the society back then my society was where those cool kids on the street and um, then you can use that material and work it through with your psychotherapist you can go back to those situations and and, and fix it and kind of rewire your emotions and that's the whole point of working on your personality and ayahuasca ceremony uh, was was extremely helpful in that way which doesn't mean it's the only way you can you can achieve the same with uh, probably way way more psychotherapy sessions because ayahuasca is like 1000 hours in a night you know? totally yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I'd like to try ayahuasca at some point. I don't know if I have enough surrender to do a psychedelic. I have I haven't ex I haven't experienced them yet. He's done a couple ceremonies, um, and he's had some pretty like profound experiences that he shared with me. Um, other than ayahuasca or psychedelics, what are some like steps that someone can take to like reinvent, like to rewire or reframe um, certain narratives that might not be helpful for them? Uh, narrative. Okay, what helped me is, was definitely meditation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not an expert. I just use meditation as a tool because from a practical point of view, it's one of the best tools to use because mm -hmm. you don't need any gym. <laughs> you can just do it anywhere because you're able to meditate when there's noise. You can meditate when, in the night when it's quiet. You can meditate sitting, standing, and so on. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that you can apply immediately anytime. And that tool really helps me um, enter this more peaceful state anytime this situation is getting a little bit too stressful, too much out of hand. And it has helped me prevent myself from sending an email <laughs> which would make <laughs> a lot of damage <laughs> or, or saying some stuff. 
uh, that was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and, uh, and then definitely those sessions. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I tried to have a call with my psychotherapist at least once per month. And sometimes it's just a five minute call. How are you doing? Everything okay? Like, is there anything we should look more in, in depth at or not? It should be like your, just like you do health checks every couple of months, you should also do your personality checks. And I think it's a taboo in, in the society we live in. There, there's so many taboos, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you know. But this is definitely helpful to always have someone next to you that can help you explain what is happening to you from the scientific rational point of view mm -hmm. because when i was trying to understand myself i could see myself as this conflicted persona like my rational part my conscious part was was fighting with something that was inside which was the subconscious programming that i had the ego which was then created by all those years of being bullied and so on and so on and i felt like i'm like i'm two, like two people right and, and it, this helped you kind of integrate and why the reason why we why i'm saying this is then I, I that went through all those personal problems and ego fixing and, and those emotional issues with, which came out during those tough times, I've realized how many problems in business are actually driven by ego issues. Like every, <laughs> every problem in business, just scratch it long enough. At some point, you will find that there's actually a communication issue. There's a problem between two people that don't want to find, a, find an issue. And being able to... Uh, look at business problems from a more humanistic way is really mm -hmm. helping a lot. Um, so it seems like the, the more I worked on myself from something that seems to be totally not related to business, that is the most single, most single, most important thing that helped me become more successful in business. Oh, which absolutely. You think it has nothing to do with business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, so want to be more in business? Put down those in one business book number 100 <laughs> um, and find some book about, I don't know, just dealing with your ego, dealing with your childhood traumas. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, the cliches are there for a reason. What, I mean, there's uh, that one saying, what got you here won't get you there. Right? You can't keep it. Uh, yes. Right? Yeah, That's yeah. a great one. And then uh, ego gets the book written. Right? Those are yeah. all, which is true because it'll get you to a certain spot and mm -hmm. certain success. But then you're going to keep finding that you're going to step on your own feet over and over again. Yeah. And that's about as far as you're going to get so until you do the work. Yeah, at some point your program gets uploaded, and, and then there's, there's no reason for your ego to develop, right? right? Mm -hmm. just, you, that's how it's created. Like, like, uh, around 30, 30 you, you, you start, start learning, learning, you start, you start, getting, you start getting older. older and and you, you, I think the I society, society we live in, we want more out of life. We are aware of that there is more to life than just feeding your hunger. Uh, and this, this is why, why you should, should actually keep, keep working, working on, on it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's cool. I I love that like the organizations like Maps is getting so much traction now and so much funding. Maps is uh in the states here. It's a organization that, that deals with psych psychedelics, but from a oh. purely medical standpoint and psych psychological standpoint. Um, but they're getting tons of traction. Psilocybin's becoming uh decriminalized in, in, in a few places. I think it's, I think Oakland and. Denver too. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're using it in post tra in those treatments for PTSD for mm -hmm. all those veterans, people with terminal illnesses, right? Mm -hmm. There's this great. You probably read this book. I, I already I already can feel it. Uh, the How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, funny fun fact. Uh, when I was also afraid of going to this ayahuasca trip, but two two things happened. The guy that, in order to do this ayahuasca ceremony, we had to go deep in the mountains in the Czech Republic because the Czech, Czech Republic, it was legal. Mm -hmm. And we agreed that we're going to meet with some people at the airport uh, and then we're going to go together, rent an off-road car and go there. And I was like, who am I going to meet? Like, who are other freaks like me that go into this ayahuasca mm -hmm. retreat? And there was 10 of us during that retreat and five of those people were doctors. <laughs> there was a there was a, a veterinary but there was a, like a cardio cardio specialist there was a neuroscience neuroscientist there was a psychologist because all these people were like we've been we've been trying to help people for the last 50 years without any significant improvement and they doctors are interested in what's happening now and i was like if doctors are going to the ceremony if 50 percent of the people at the ceremony were doctors something is happening right um and the second thing which also happened to me, 
because I, I'm aware how powerful that external validation need, how this, how powerful this is in business, how it can help you. I was afraid that after ayahuasca ceremony, after I become too spiritual, you know, I would just sell all my stuff, move to the desert and just become this, you know, yogi, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I will lose all that drive to do business. And, and I ask myself, like, am I still going to be motivated to do stuff, to build stuff, build businesses? And I got that answer. I, I remember while being in that state of full bliss and being, you know, just wanting to hug everyone, the tree and the people and my enemies and telling them I love me, I love them. I asked myself, wait a second, in this state, do I still want to continue my business? And the answer was like, yeah, I can't wait until this is over because I keep, I want to send an email and I want to still you know, meet my team. It, it had, had no negative um, effect on my willingness to grind, like you said. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the tool that motivates you change. And that was really comforting. Yeah, I think that's really important because that's a huge misconception that a lot of like high performers or artists have is like, you know, there's that picture of like the struggling artist or the tortured artist and they have to like feel a certain amount of anger or pain to be able to like create something that's worthwhile. Um, and I can only kind of speak, speak from my experience, but I think like you said earlier, the more you work on yourself – um, as far as like ego work or um, child work or just like healing certain traumas, like it will 100% show up on the business end as well. So like both of those things yeah. kind of grow together. Would you say that uh, a lot of this had started, you seem to be, identify yourself as like a learner, someone that, I guess, yeah. yeah, would you was a lot of your motivation to do all this introspective work and everything, not just the pains and everything, but it was it like a drive for growth too? Uh, I think I do have the drive for growth. I feel like I, so on a, on a daily basis, when I go to sleep, I always try to think, okay, what have I learned today? What, what is, what has changed between the morning and now? And if I feel like I haven't done anything, I would be upset. Sometimes I would just go to, youtube and watch a ted talk you know just was like okay at least i've learned this right mm -hmm. and um hmm, that's actually a good point um i do feel in i would say that i need to learn something to the to the extent that i feel insecure if i don't do do, do this uh, on the flip side when something bad happens to me i'm like okay this is a chance for an opportunity and which helps me to deal with that rejection helps me to deal with that problem but I would definitely say that that feeling, okay, I have just learned something is one of the most satisfying things you can get because everything kind of comes and goes, right? I'm super hungry. I just had two steaks and I'm like, I, I'm going to be hungry again. It's like everything else feels like you can never have enough. Uh, and tomorrow you will still be hungry and you, you're just going to feel, you're just going to eat something cool again. Or you're going to visit to another country or going to, you're going to want to have another car and they're going to come up with a new model and you want this model again. But with getting more knowledge into yourself, it's kind of more feeling in a way, more, most, more satisfying in, in the long term. I can't put this into words, but in a way it's like more stable. That satisfaction kind of stays with you mm -hmm. uh, while everything else seems so um, artificial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you just made me realize that. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I need to, I need to do something interesting every day, because mm -hmm. if all I did was sending emails and talking to my team and or just doing a business, I feel like, well, okay, what's what's the what's the point then, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, do you do you feel like maybe you just need to like add add some value to your life's experience in some way, or like just add some value even to the people around you because you're you're a leader of people, right? Like you have people that work for you. I do. I, I consider myself as a shitty manager, though. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm not the guy that works with them on a daily basis. Uh, but obviously, we have a big organization. I mean, the Jumia, the, the African one, that was like the one that I was responsible for directly uh, was almost 400. So I had 10 managers which direct, uh, reported directly to me, 10 managers, and they had their own teams. And that was the worst time of my life. That's where I realized um, that's not what I want to do. Um, but I, I guess that's the missing part because you learn something so you add another brick of value and it stays you just added another big that building is getting bigger whether when it comes to like urges like having this cool drink or this cool thing buy this you will use it and then it will go away and you want another one mm -hmm. well 
learning is adding value that stays. I mm -hmm. think that's the, that's the metaphor. That's cool. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. That's a really good way to put it. I like that. Mm -hmm. So, have, you know, after all these, this introspective work and all this psychological work that you've done, have you noticed that your passions has changed or maybe even your, your missions or v visions of your life or anything like that? It sounds like um, entrepreneurship has been a big passion of yours. Um, and I know that you started a foundation. And yeah, I definitely wanted to get into the foundation. At anyway, some point yeah, how, how has that journey been as far as like what you focus on, your passions, the things that like intrinsically motivate you and how has it changed throughout your life's experiences? Yeah, I had a big problem with knowing what I really want to do in life, like really, like really, really, which is one of the reasons why I went for the ayahuasca retreat, trying to understand that. Um, and it, it also felt like I was changing businesses way too often. Like I, I, I look at my last 10 years of life and I realized I, would, I didn't stay in one business more than three years. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't stay in one location more than a year. Like Candice has mentioned this, right? Um, I, I, was, I was never with a girlfriend longer than a year and a half. And there was like this pattern. And, and I figured that it's going to end with age. But then I was 30 something and it was still there. So I was like, this is not the age thing. This is, uh, this is already coded in you unless you, uh, unless you change it. And then psychotherapy made me understand that this is, this is linked to me not really knowing what I want to do in life. I don't have that uh, compass. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it did change a lot. The process of writing the book, the psychotherapy, trying to understand what I want to do. Um, has it changed? I wouldn't say it has changed. I actually have it now for the first time. <laughs> so like I know what I want to do in 10 years from now. I mean, mm -hmm. I, never, I could never answer the question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you turn 30, I'm 34 now, you want to have that question. You want to have that answer, right? When you're 20s, you're still figuring out. But after you pass 30, you want to finally be able to build on your experience to know where, where to go. So I hope that my current girlfriend is my last one. <laughs> um, I, I want to stay in my current business for at least 10 years because that's, that was very, uh, not, that's very exciting and also scary for me. That, mm -hmm. Okay, this is the reason I will stay for 10 years for good or bad, because you can't build anything significant unless you stay in 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's my goal now. So that's scary. But I, I, at the same time, I told myself, I really value the freedom of movement. Uh, so most of the businesses or responsibilities I always take on uh, need to have a deal breaker. It, I need to be able to do it from anywhere I want, and as long as there's internet. Um, this is why I don't really have too many assets as well, because I consider like hard assets, like real estate or land, mm -hmm. because you're somehow tied to it. So I, I prefer to have stocks or investment funds that invest in real estate because that allows me to move. Mm -hmm. um, it somehow gives me the freedom of movement in this and stability in this unstable world. Uh, I consider assets which are more, more liquid, actually more safe. Thanks to the fact that they are liquid. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the current world uh, uh, we live in. So, um, yeah, your question was about my passion and what drives me and where I want to be. So um, now I know it, it, it needs to be tied to being in one business for longer, but being able to move around at least geographically. Um, and I know what I don't want to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I guess... I am enjoying the very early stage of a company, which is where nothing happens, like there's chaos, I'm allergic to Excel. So, but in order to stay in 10 years with a company, I know that I will have to change positions or change departments uh, and keep push, push the company from a different place, but stay in this one business. And uh, what Africa has taught me, and let's get to Africa for a while, mm -hmm. I've been talking about <laughs> uh, it, it, the, the, the personal stuff for a while. What Africa has really given me it might sound naive for some, but I really like the fact that, you know, I build a business and make money, but also I see that this business has a positive uh, effect on, on the people around because we've hired people that usually wouldn't have a chance to work in an online company. They would probably be able to work in a not technological company because we were one of the first in technology companies to come to Nigeria in 2012. Um, we solve real problems. I feel like there's capitalism at, this, at its best stage mm -hmm. where it that still doesn't destroy the, the environment. There are no multi-corporations which are more powerful than countries. 
you see real people building real businesses solving real problems like the the capitalism that adam smith wrote about not the capitalism and stock exchange and everything being virtual so you see that and i enjoyed that um i am doing something good and i'm also making money perfect like what's not to like mm -hmm. and now I kind of looking for the same thing, but maybe not by my geography because I don't want to do only Africa. I've invested in the solar business, but I'm trying to get the same out of it. I'm still hopefully able to make some money because re renewable energy is are on the rise. But as long as you, you've, you build the business in renewable energy in a proper way, you're also able to solve some climate issues. Um, so there's also this positive aspect. It's like this sustainable capitalism where you have four stakeholders, which are equally important, clients, employees, investors, but also the, the planet. Um, so again, maybe this is too naive. Uh, it's not as, as black and white as, I, as, as I'm trying to make it uh, seem, but I like the combination of uh, making money, but also I see this one KPI that I'm improving, like removing, you know, lowering down the carbon footprint. That's one nice KPI that I see that I can quantify. And if it goes down, that's my quantification of doing something positive. And that's what I stick to. That's really cool. So you you found a place, sounds like you found a place that you've melded kind of like your own personal desires with your business aspirations and a sense of contribution. Correct. And that is an amazing state to be in. Uh, but I've paid my price to find, to find that place, yeah? And it's not easy. <laughs> You said you thank your wife? No, he found No, no I, 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 I paid my price. Oh, paid your price, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did want to talk about um, your foundation and kind of how that came about, your inspiration behind it. So you mentioned that these like really big – um, organizations that are showing like these little bloated babies um, that are living in poverty, how they've done like a huge disservice to Africa. So can you kind of expand on that? Yeah. So I always wanted to have like a charity initiative, but I figured mm -hmm. it's going to be only after I'm super old and, and probably hopefully rich. <laughs> and the, the reason why I did this much earlier is because I didn't want to be accused of, you know, publishing this book and essentially exposing some bad things, which brings some bad PR to Nigeria for money. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this is the time to do it, to make a statement, I'm not doing this for the money and so on. And then I started exploring and researching the called sector of charities. Mm -hmm. And I approached the problem just like any investor would approach, like show me your P&L, show me your return on investment, how are you managing this organization, what is the long-term result and so on. And oh my God, what I have explored. I mean, if, if an organization is burning 60% of the money they're raising, that's, that's okay. <laughs> it's getting way worse. And the organizations have become so big that even they're, if they like it or not, they're too detached from the problem they were built to solve. Mm. Big charities are amazing to solve one-time crisis like war or a natural catastrophe they don't work when you're solving like a structural problem of, of a poverty. I mean, mm -hmm. because if, if they did, we would have solved it by now, a long time ago. And I've also realized that the West has done three very bad things uh, to Africa. They've colonized Africa, which was bad. Then they've decolonized Africa by creating those fake countries where conflicted ethnic groups fight with each other, which makes the country still very weak and, and uh, exposed to corruption which is, I think, even worse than the colonization itself because it's a long-term effect. And then they threw, so much, they threw so much aid in the last couple decades, and that aid was like giving fish instead of teaching how to fish, right? You know that mm -hmm. problem. And, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm not getting into it. So long story short, I'm going to open a tiny, tiny charity because it's only going to be my money from the book, maybe my, a little bit of my personal money and some friends who I asked but maybe small foundation is what we need maybe we need more smaller foundation we don't want one person that solves all the problems we want many people getting involved right so i was like size is, is super cool and then i was like i'm this guy coming from the technology sector uh technology can solve many issues it can bring transparency to how funds are being distributed in in a country like kenya people don't use cash that often anymore you can actually pay to anyone, even a taxi driver with a, with a mobile wallet because there's a mobile wallet that works on a feature phone. You don't need to have a smartphone and so on and so on. And I was like, I can, I can 
put, bring the technology learnings that I learned building e-commerce business in Nigeria into the charity foundation. And then I was like, who do I help? And I figured, I think I'm super extremely lucky guy because I was born in Poland just after communism or like at the end of it. So if I was born 10 years earlier, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Mm. Um, I was, I'm extremely lucky. So let me find a group of people which are so, uh, they're so in such a deep sheet, sorry for my French, that, doesn't, that even if they are the second Einstein, they will never make it. Mm-hmm. So they're screwed on every, any single level. So I didn't need to look, look long, look far. Uh, Nigeria, there's a state called Borno, when you have, first of all, radical Islam, uh, extreme poverty, no power, no electricity, uh, droughts, extreme hot sun, no water. Then you have Boko Haram and that are killing the villagers, they're kidnapping girls, turning them into wives, into slaves. You probably heard about this, that action, bring back our girls a couple of years ago. So that's that village. And it's extremely dangerous. A couple of weeks ago, there were four people working for the United Nations, I think, killed. Wow. And I was like, if we help them, at least we're putting some, some efforts into someone that is screwed the most possible way. Because I wanted to redistribute luck in life. That was my intention. And then my girlfriend came and she's like, but let's focus on, uh, on orphan girls. Because if you're an orphan, then you're screwed even more. You don't have parents. And if you're a girl, then you're screwed even more. Because in radical Islam, to put it in a diplomatic terms, uh, I mean, the position of the woman in the society is not the strongest, right? So mm-hmm. your chances of becoming successful, independent woman uh, are super, super low. And she said, let's focus on the girls because if you're helping girls in a, in a very underdeveloped region, it's like solving three problems at once because educated and empowered women will make sure that the kids are also educated. Uh, the problem with those very, very poor communities is that parents will have 10 kids because they assume if I have 10 kids, only five will survive because there's no you know, public health and so on. So they have way too many kids, but they're poor. So it's even harder for them to feed those kids. So it's like a you know, vicious circle, but educated and empowered woman will make sure she doesn't have too many kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in a way, contraception and so on. And then educated and empowered woman will get into business. And like we discussed earlier, more women in business makes better business. I mean, this, is, this has been proven. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's researched left and right. So we've decided to focus on, on orphan girls in that deep Borno state in Nigeria. We found a uh, school for, for orphans and we're doing this step by step. First, by providing them with basic infrastructure, they need to build the walls in that school, have chairs, uh, books, materials, laptops are coming in. And then we're going to choose. And again, you have to maximize your chances of half of your help being sustainable and have long-term results, we will choose those girls which show the best results in mathematics. Because if you're good at math, there's a high chance you'll be a good accountant or a web developer. And if they're going to be trained to be a mathematics teacher, uh, the accountant or a web developer, me with my network of people, I'm able to get them an internship or a job. And in the end, bring her from this very poor community into a city where she makes, starts making money and she becomes independent. And then maybe she will be thankful enough and she will do something like that. So instead of, instead of sponsoring 1,000 meal for 1,000 kids once, I prefer to choose a couple kids but help, help them as long as it's needed uh, until they become financially independent. So it's not as sexy as, you know, showing we just built this thing and we gave them those those laptops you can't make a press release out of it because the results are not visible for a long time mm-hmm. but if you do it on your own with your own money you don't have to do stuff to make that makes it look sexy because mm-hmm. you're not relying on someone else's money mm-hmm. so that's the story about maya foundation it's the very beginning you know uh, uh we you know the book has been in sales for a couple months we've raised so far around twenty five thousand dollars uh, but, you know, we start small and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll see where, where this is going to go. You know? And uh, there's, a, there's a big satisfaction with doing something on your own, even on a small scale. So that's super, super cool. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, how do you source, oh, should, how do you find the, the, or, the girls? Like, how much time do you spend in Africa going through these different orphanages and everything? Oh, no, so, oh, no, we, so just we just chose just one school. school. There's, there's around 180 school. kids. Okay. 
Uh, most, most of them, of them are girls and our friends. And then we, right now we just focus on building the infrastructure for the school itself. Uh, and then once they are able to have normal math lessons, <laughs> Uh, uh, with materials, with, 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 with notebooks and so on, because this is how, like, like when, when we, we saw the focus on the school, school, kids were sitting on the ground, on the ground. like they were, they were not, not even church. So, so this is how far, how, how much, much it, work, work has, has to be done. Be done. And, then and then after, after some time, after, after the school becomes a properly working school, I expect that this will happen six months from now, maybe 12. That's where we're going to start looking at, okay, who is getting good grades? Who can we send to? A boarding, a boarding school, school. because we already so have, have a, a partnership, partnership with a boarding, boarding school, school in Lagos, Lagos Nigeria. Nigeria. Those, Those girls, girls can make, make friends, friends with girls from, from middle class, class and have, have you know, just become, become more, more feel more, more valuable, valuable in the society. society. Mm -hmm. And then and I, I actually have a deal already with a Polish, Polish university, university that, that will uh, give them the tuition for. I mean, we'll teach them for free. We just have to cover their place to live and and eat. So, so um, we just have just to have deliver, deliver that, to that, 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 that state. state. So it's a long, wow. long, long process. Yeah, and this is still new, right? But have you thought about, I mean, I'd imagine that it's just like any other orphanages where the children have traumas that are going to prevent them from becoming as successful yeah. or being a powerful woman. Um, yeah. Have you guys thought through exactly how you're going to tackle that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, the psychology, psychology psychotherapy support, support is already part of this uh, part of this program. Yeah, yeah. We have yeah. some great consultants who uh, have, have been, been working. working. I'm not I'm the only one that noticed that there's something wrong in the current system, system of charity. Uh, and and uh, I have people coming to me and they're like, they want to have their own support uh, because they also see a problem. And uh, that's what I said. It's better if more people help a little bit than one organization tries to solve all the problems. Uh, so, so if anyone, anyone listening is here is interested, like just, just check out chasing like my foundation and uh, uh, send an email how you can how we can help. We do. We actually there is actually a button. If someone is interested, you can also you can also support financially. Yeah, awesome. Course, yeah. And then, you know, or just buy the book and uh, money from the book goes to charity. Uh, so if the book is shit, at least you support it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you're doing a lot of really cool things, and it's exciting to hear that that you're so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's I guess it's super cool place to be in. When first of all you do something cool, and it also allows you to pay your bills. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I paid my price. I mean, <laughs> in order to in order to be in a place when money don't matter that much anymore. I mean, first you have to make some money because the first jobs that I've done was all about money, right? I, would, I was eating shit just to, just, to, just to make money. So it's, it's so easy to say, you know, money is not going to give you happiness, focus on what you love, but the, not everyone has that comfort. And what, what you said, uh, what brought you here is not going to take you there. So all those things in life to stick to uh, differ depending on where you are. So do not listen to those 30 year old millionaires that you can uh, read about on TechCrunch or BuzzFeed because most of them come from privileged families, right? And, mm -hmm. and the best way to, uh, to really put this into perspective is, and that was in Nigeria, someone put on Twitter this famous photo of Apple being started in a garage, Hewitt Packard being started in a garage, and then Amazon being started in a garage or Google, whatever. And then the, the motivation was behind it. Like, what stops you from? I've seen that, yeah. The same, yeah. And then someone from Nigeria, like, my parents don't have a house with a garage. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, which, which, I mean, this is the whole point of, of distributing the absolute basics um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and chances of success. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like you have, um, you got a cool path ahead of you too. You got 10 years committed into contributing in this way right? nine and a half to go yeah nine and a half we, to just, go. we just started yeah <laughs> that's so cool so what's the major impact that you're trying to make so um now most of my time is is focused i mean most of my time i i i'm i'm first of all i i have a i'm responsible for a marketing agency which is focused on africa uh most of big e-commerce businesses are working with us. I used to build e-commerce. Now I'm kind of have an agency that helps e-commerce grow in Africa. But like I said, I didn't want to be 
just the Africa guy. I want to learn. At some point, you don't want to end up being just in routine and you need to learn. So I decided to change my geographical focus and also change my sector focus. So we've invested in the Swedish startup that builds solar roofs. Basically, they're trying to, uh, they're not trying, they're actually doing it. They're, they're, they're becoming a pretty important competition for Tesla roofs. You guys know Tesla for sure, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're now called the European Tesla roofs, I guess. I want, if, they, if someone calls them like this, I don't mind. And I've joined them. I've invested some money and I've become the co-founder. And uh, this is extremely cool for me because on one side, I'm learning a lot because the geographical focus is not Africa only. I mean, everyone needs solar power. Everyone needs renewable energies for different reasons. In Europe, it's because you want to be green. In Africa, because if you don't have power from solar, many times you don't have power at all. Um, And I need to learn about the business itself because this is the first time in my life when the business I'm in is physical. I can touch the product that we produce. Because for me, it was first financial sector and then it was startup, software, e-commerce. I could never touch what I was making. And here, actually, I can touch the roof, right? (laughs) If it breaks, people will have uh, water running on their heads. So that's, again, frightening and a huge learning curve for me. And then, like I said, uh, the the world is dealing now with, with big problem. Like, we can't rely on fossil fuels forever. Uh, we have to figure out a way to uh, live on renewable energy, and uh, solar power is a big is a big chance to solve this issue. Also, by empowering people, because I can't imagine having a micro nuclear plant in your basement. I can't imagine having this huge, uh, you know, fan. I know it was the English word uh, to to collect energy from wind in your house. But solar on your roof is actually doable. And there's been a lot of changes in technology. It's becoming way more efficient, way more cheap for every individual to create its own uh, power source. And especially in countries where people don't have that much money, uh, being able to rely on your own power source is a game changer. Maybe you don't see it that that's much in the States because you just pay those electricity bills. They're not that big. You may want to go green. You may want to go solar because you care about the environment. You're a Tesla driving vegan. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, in, uh, in, in Nigeria or in Kenya, electricity price might be 40% of your budget, of your monthly family budget. Mm-hmm. So it's a game changer if you have your own electricity source. So besides going good stuff for the environment by you know, not relying only on fossil fuels, you can also empower families by uh, giving them a free energy source. Of course, after the initial investment, which can be solved very with a loan or and, and in many different uh, solutions that then you end up this, having the solution that pays itself. So for me, this is the combination of having a trend which is growing like crazy. Solar is, is, is definitely growing as a business. But then again, having that one cool thing that I see like, again, okay, I haven't opened a casino. I, I'm not producing vodka. I'm not, I don't have a tequila brand, which kind of, it, I don't think it's solving issues, right? Here I see this something positive. Uh, as naive as it may sound, you can challenge this. Um, I kind of have satisfaction by looking at this from that, that way. You've kind of positioned yourself as a bit of an expert in this in emerging market of Africa. You've been, you've been dealing business around Africa for quite a while now. Whether I, think, I like it or not, yeah? Because it's been yeah. uh, almost 10 years, so there's not, not too many people doing that, yeah. yeah. So in the, in, the, in the spirit of trying to like pull out some of your knowledge and share it to some listeners, um, Peter Diamandis, I think, is like just a cool, cool entrepreneur. He's one of my favorites. I, I love all his books and everything like that. And he always says that the greatest um, problems in the world are where you can find the biggest business opportunities. What I'm listening to is that there are, some, there are definitely people out there like yourself who think that entrepreneurship is, is their to contribute, right? To solve the world's problems in some sense, and then obviously make profit off of it. Yeah. And then um, I think that that's just an awesome, that's just a great way to live your life. Um, But then there are also uh, certain investors out there that just really want to get involved with emerging markets, not because of the, not just because of the business opportunities there, but because they need capital. And, you know, if capitalism is there to help, which I think it is, then they need more capital flowing into those direction. And then there's kind of like the middle class, kind of like the regular, you know, normal people that are always looking to get involved in something that is beneficial or somewhere to invest their money or anything like that. 
So my three questions is, as an entrepreneur, how can someone from the States or anywhere outside of Africa get involved with um, either some of the startups that are there or how can they contribute in some way? Or are there, are there even entrepreneurial opportunities from a distance? This is, this is typical for frontier and emerging markets. What is typical for them out of many things is that it's very hard for that middle class guys get involved. Uh, do you remember that uh, uh, the Volvo tracks ad advertisement with Jean-Claude Van Damme when he was doing the split between those two tracks? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many people try to r run or in, in their businesses in Africa or invest in Africa like that. They have their business in the States or in Europe and then they're trying to invest or do something in, in, in Africa and then they see that these huge tracks are just get, getting far from each other and they're getting bigger and bigger split like Jean-Claude Van Damme. This is not doable. A frontier, it, it, it is doable, but the chance of success is super low because what frontier and emerging markets have in common is lack of transparency uh, uh, and lack of infrastructure that allows cash flow, information flow, uh, uh, legal disputes to be solved internationally and so on. You have to be on the ground. And if you don't have a big scale enough, uh, you, don't, you don't have the resources to, 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 to send someone on the ground, right? When I look at foreigners building businesses in emerging or frontier markets, and it doesn't apply only to uh, Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, and remember, this is, we're talking about 54 countries. There are different stages of growth. But you can, you can apply the same rule to certain Latin American countries, Southeast Asia, or even further, far Eastern Europe. Um, you can either launch a business on your own, and it's a very small business that allows you to micromanage it. Or it's a huge business that has enough resources that allows you to um, hire proper senior management uh, uh, experts. Uh, senior management man managers to to make sure that the business is running the proper way for you or train train them on your own. But there are no financial tools like investment funds uh, which are transparent uh, or platforms that vet those startups which allow you to easily get in and get out because the market is not liquid. Those are those problems. You need to wait until the market gets more developed. Um, uh, unless you decide to just stop whatever you're doing and then and then move on your own. But if you're now I mean, just a middle class, uh, middle class guy or a small and medium sized entrepreneur and your ticket investment ticket that you can size is anywhere from 10 to $100,000, it's going to be, it's going to be tough because it's not enough to do, go there and do it on your own. And also investment funds, the ticket is too small to become a limited partner. Like investment funds want us, you know, you want to be at least what, 250, $500,000 to become a partner in an investment fund that then does the searching for you. They're on the ground. They're making sure that no one, you know, steals your money or fucks you over. Or, I'm sorry for my French. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the problem, unfortunately, uh, which is uh, uh, symptomatic for market at this stage of growth. So there's no like crowdfunding platform that has just like impactful companies or anything like that. And then... If there are, stay out of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So nothing with credibility. Unfortunately, uh, it, it's it, it's not there yet. Uh, mm -hmm. In order for crowdfunding platforms to be successful, there has to be a certain level of trust in the market. It's basically essentially into trust. Like Airbnb couldn't be successful in 2012 in Nigeria because you couldn't trust the hosts. The understanding of what it is to rent a house to someone else was just not there, not there yet. But now it's happening, right? But we started by building the trust in e-commerce. In 2012, people were afraid to order anything online because how could they trust that I'm paying, you know, for this, I don't know, phone and someone will send it to me. This is why you had to have cash on delivery. Every new business model requires different level of trust in the sector, in the society, in the market. And uh, you can see this from hindsight that it's getting in stages and every stage allows you to launch another type of business. And I think crowdfunding is just not there yet to be, to be big enough. Although there are platforms, I just don't consider them as a, as a big enough, successful enough uh, to, to, to go there yet. Some mm -hmm. people might be offended, especially those funders. Um, and there definitely are some cases that those platforms are working. There's one which allows you to uh, loan money to farmers because farmers are super small, super scattered in Nigeria. 
they actually need to borrow money to you know buy some seeds and and, ma and make some grow some vegetables you can help them and i know that this is working in agriculture pretty nicely um you probably are going to do this to make money you are also going to do this for this social uh, social impact but if you're looking only at maximizing your investment return that's where this is lacking yet the problem with africa is that there's enough money but the local local investors they don't want to look at technology businesses they still prefer to make money out of oil uh, but the foreign investors, they bring the money they invested in, but they keep the locals outside. There is no transfer of knowledge. The most important element of growth of any market for me are repats, are immigrants. They've moved to the States when they were 15. They finished their education there. They've worked for a couple of years in an organization, in a business. They've learned a lot. They came back with money, with knowledge, and with passion to build the local business. So uh, sometimes instead of you pushing there, bring someone in, uh, help him get a visa, give him some uh, support here, and then let him come back and do the job, the good job with his hands. Well, uh, I think that the best way to do it would be just to support you in some way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, already, you're already there. You're already doing it. Right. Find someone that's already doing it well. Yeah. Our foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, thank you so much for the invitation. You guys have a huge platform. So I, I can assume that Mm, there will be some people who will find it interesting and thanks to you i will reach, uh, reach them so. where do we find you how do we follow you how do mm -hmm. we how do we help in some way whatever it might be let's plug as you already know it's impossible to have my name as my domain <laughs> <because> <laughs> no <one has> it. <laughs> but uh, the book title is pretty easy to remember because it's chasing black unicorns .com is the website mm -hmm. and, and that and on that website you'll find everything about the book everything about the foundation also, all those links to reach out to me, social media handles, everything is there. Because it's the, this is why the book title was supposed to be easy. <laughs> yep, beautiful. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. I really um, appreciate your time. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have the time, please rate and review. And you can always hit subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. I hope to have you back. Thank you.